Hello everybody. If you subscribe to the channel, you know at the end of the last video I was talking about leaving the mechanical work of RM1214 behind to concentrate on some of the cosmetic work. Well, unfortunately, our plans have changed. As you can see, the bus no longer has an engine. And that's because the other day we took the bus out for fuel. On the way to the petrol station, she suffered a major mechanical failure. Now we don't know what has caused the problem, but on the way to the petrol station, we lost power. The engine mast started making a, an awful noise. So we limped the bus back home here, and this is where she's sat ever since. Now we were going to run the engine up to show you just how bad it sounded, but we decided it was probably too risky to do that. So today's video is going to be about how we change an engine on RM1214. Lucky enough, we do have some spare engines here. So we're going to do a complete engine change. And at the same time, while the engine's out, we're going to take some time to make good the, the engine bay. It was looking a bit tatty and a bit worn. So we're going to give that a lick of paint and make that look a little bit fresher and nicer. We're also going to do some investigation work to find out what went wrong with her original engine. So we've got a busy couple of days ahead of us. So let's get on and let's get busy. So with Tim prepping and undercoating the engine bay, it was my job to make a start putting one of our spare engines back together. So here's the damage engine, we've now got it out the bus and as you can see over here, this is the engine that's going to go in the bus, it's in bits at the moment, there's a few bits we need to take off the old engine to put on here, it needs rebuilding, but we're going to do that now and then get it on the bus later on in the week. Now as spare parts for these engines have become scarcer and scarcer over the years, it's now necessary to swap various bits from the damage engine and fit them on the replacement block. Now that's not an ideal situation, but we have no choice. It also causes us many, many hours of extra work.
with the sump back on, it was time for the delicate task of lifting the engine back upright again. Right, before we go any further, let's just do a quick Q&A because I'm sure you've got loads of questions you want to ask us. Now, these are different engines. The engine we're putting in is an AEC AV590 engine. However, the engine we've taken out is an AEC AV690 engine. Now, the main difference between the two is the 690 is 11.3 litres, the 590 is a 9.6 litre engine. Now, originally, the AEC AV590 engine was fitted to the Routemaster. Now, there were variants of this, but generally speaking, the majority of standard Routemasters entered service in the 1960s with a 590 engine. Well, to appreciate the answer to that question, you have to understand the working lives these engines have had. The bus engine, the 590, has had a very hard life. It's been on a bus for 30 years, done millions of miles on the streets of London. Now, London Transport were fabulous at maintaining their engines at the Chiswick Works, but there's only so many times you can replace the moving parts of an engine. The block and the sump and everything eventually becomes porous, and that's why quite often these days you do see routemasters dripping the odd bit of oil when they've been parked up for a couple of days. On the other hand, the 690, these are ex-military engines. And like London Transport, the military were very good at maintaining their engines. But these engines have done very few hours in comparison to the bus engine. They were typically used as generator engines for the RAF. And when they became surplus, a load of Routemaster owners bought these engines. They were going quite cheap and they fitted them into their buses. Now to the untrained eye, these engines look identical. In fact, they are. The only difference is when they're running, the 690 has a bit more of a grunt to it. And so a lot of owners got rid of the tired old 590s and replaced them with 690s. And of course the other advantage is you do get a bit of extra power with the 690. Now we run a 690 in our open topper and that engine just flies off the mark. It doesn't give you much more with regards to top speed but acceleration, that bus just absolutely flies. So I can well and truly see the advantage of putting a 690 in a Routemaster. Well, lucky enough, we have a couple of spare engines here. This particular example was actually in the open topper in RM1783. Now, when we first got that bus, because of the, the Clangothlin tours that we do, driving up and down the hills, we decided to put a 690 in that bus for the extra power. So this 590 became surplus. And it's a recently Rubot engine. We know it's a good engine. We've just got to take some of the bits off the damaged engine and put them on here, and it'll be ready to go in the bus. Right, that's it for the questions for now. Don't forget, if there's a question that we've not answered that you'd like to know the answer to, please put that in the box below. Get typing and we do reply to every single question that we receive. We've got some more work to do on this engine before we can get it in the bus, so we're going to crack on with that now.
So there you have it. That's the majority of the paintwork done. There's one or two attention to detail bits that we're going to do shortly. But for now, I love the silvering on the engine. I love the silvering on the A-frame. And I love the red that Tim did around the bulkhead and the cab firewall. I can't wait to see this engine back on the bus because I know that engine bay is going to look a thousand times better than what it did before we took the damaged engine out. Now work on this engine is progressing. We've still got loads of ancillaries that we need to put on this engine before it can go back on the bus. That work is going to take us at least another couple of days. But for now the work has ground to a halt because we've lost an oil seal. Now I've turned the unit upside down looking for my spare oil seals. I know I've got three or four of them in stock but I couldn't find them anywhere. The oil seal I'm talking about is a lip seal that runs across the end of the crankshaft here. So until we find that we ain't going nowhere putting any oil or putting this engine back together. We've had to order a new one, lucky enough they are still available, so until the postman delivers that oil seal, we're going to have to find some other work to do. Now, one of the things I've been really desperate to do on this bus is replace these aluminium trims on the radiator grill. As you can see, they're all dented on both sides, it's hanging out at the bottom, they really are in a terrible state. Now, of course, the problem with this is these things are not available in the shops. You can't just phone up online and order them because nobody makes them anymore. But as I say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And fortunately, through another Routemaster owner, I've been able to get a replacement set. Now, these are original LT supplied aluminium trims for the radiator grill. So thank you to Graham Rickson, who owns RM254, who agreed to sell me these. So we're going to put these on and when we finally get the engine back in and we put this radiator grill back on, the front of the bus is going to look stunning. Now the big challenge when you remove these alley strips is removing the nuts that secure them in place. You undo them from the back of the grill but the problem is they've been there for 30 years and so you've got to be really careful that you don't snap the studs. So with all the nuts removed and only one stud snapped, it was time to gently remove the aluminium strips from the radiator grill. Finally it was just a case of lining up the brand new strips on the radiator grill and then a little bit of good old fashioned elbow grease to polish them up so they look as good as new. Well, there you have it, some nice new aluminium trims on our radiator grill supplied by Graham Rickson. Thank you very much, Graham, for allowing me to buy some spare stock that you had lying around in your garage. I think the difference is incredible. It's really going to make the front of 1214 look so much nicer. And I can't wait to see this on the bus just as soon as we crack on and get this engine sorted. Well, the good news is the seal has arrived. So we're going to crack on with the engine again today. Now, one of the first jobs I want to get done is check that the thermostat in this housing here hasn't seized. As you know, this engine has been off a bus for a number of years. It's laid on its side, so the thermostat inside here could have seized itself closed. Now, that could be very, very dangerous for the engine. In case you don't know how a thermostat works, basically, when the engine is cold, the thermostat is closed. It acts like a plug. 
But as things heat up, as the engine's running and as the water temperature starts rising, that water temperature expands the metal inside the thermostat. And when that expands, it opens the plug and allows water down this pipe here into the radiator. Now, of course, when the water gets into the radiator, that's where it's cooled down and then it's pumped back into the engine again to keep things nice and cool. But of course, if the thermostat is seized, then that's going to be a big problem because it means that the water won't be cooling down and will be faced with an engine that overheats itself very, very quickly. So I think it's worth just spending 10 minutes this morning undoing the housing and checking that the thermostat in here is still working. <laughs> So with the thermostat removed, we needed to find out whether or not it was in fact seized or not. And to do that, the procedure is incredibly technical. Well, the good news is we know now that the thermostat is working so it can go back on the bus. I've made a new gasket, so we put it back on and put it back in its housing. Well, okay, that probably wasn't the most technical thing we've ever done, but with peace of mind knowing that the thermostat is working, it was time to continue rebuilding the engine. The good news is we're just about ready to put this engine back in the bus but there's still one or two little jobs to do. Now before we do that I just thought I'd do a little run round of the engine because we've been getting a lot of people asking for more technical explanations about what we do um, on our videos. So for all you technical petrol heads here's a little run round of what is on the left hand side of the engine and we'll start here this is the fuel pump. Part of the fuel pump here is what we call the lift pump. Now the lift pump sucks the fuel up like that from the fuel tank and then once it's gone through the lift pump, the fuel will come up through here into the fuel filter. It comes out the other side and back down into the fuel pump here. Now, once the fuel enters, the fuel pump it is then injected under pressure through some pipes that we've yet to put on and into the six injectors that run the engine. Now, further forward, we've got the reservoir here for the power steering. Now, bearing in mind, these buses were designed in the 50s and built in the 60s. And for them to be fitted with power steering at that time, they were well and truly ahead of the game. So here's the power steering reservoir. We've got the eyeglass here so you can see your power steering fluid levels. And then the power steering pump is down here and that pumps the oil from, from the engine here around the power steering system to the power steering ram which is just behind the driver's seat. Right, moving on to this side of the bus and there's not an awful lot to see over here. At the back you've got the starter motor, that's this big beast here. And when you press the starter bomb in the cab to get the engine running, the starter motor engages with the ring gear on the flywheel and that fires the engine into life. Moving further forward, you've got the housing for the oil filter and you've got the accelerator rods here as well for the acceleration. Because when, when you put your foot down on the accelerator pedal in the cab, you are, your foot is directly connected to the uh, fuel pump via rods and springs that run all the way around the engine. Moving right further forward, you've got the water pump at the front and that will be plumbed in once we get the radiator in place and finally down the bottom here is the alternator and again that will be fitted once the engine is back on the bus. Right, technical lesson over with, it was time to get the engine back inside the engine bay and we had to be very careful with this, we didn't want to damage any of that new paintwork.
bearings are really coming together now. That's the engine bolted in. We've just got to move the bus over to another part of the unit so we can lift it up and connect everything that's underneath. Well, yesterday was a really productive day. We got the engine back in the bus, we got the bus lifted up in the air and everything underneath has now been connected. We've done the engine mounts, we've done the alternator and we've done the starter motor. Today, we're concentrating on the fuel pump and the fuel system and we're gonna be plumbing in the radiator as well. So after a lot of hard work and late nights, the end is almost in sight. Our final job was to fill the engine with oil and water. Right, here we go. It's the moment of truth. We've checked everything and we've double checked everything. But the big question is, will this engine start? Here we go. 